Good morning again. Good morning. How wonderful is it to be gathered together to open our Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. Amen. We introduced this new systematic study, expositional study through 1 John last Sunday. Today we get to dig in. Scratch the surface, as it were, a couple of verses, verses 1 and 2. Save 3 and 4, maybe for next week. We've affixed a title or a central theme or thought to 1 John and all of our studies through this wonderful book, and it's on the screen, Finding Fellowship with God. We talked about that, some of the pillars, some of the foundational biblical truths. Uh, that direct us in that way, we'll be kind of covering and, and rehashing that relationship that we can have with God. Every single study, I'm sure, as we will again this morning. First two verses are so very important. And so for that, today, we've affixed this title, Just Give Me Jesus, Just Give Me Jesus. So you can write that in your bulletin and uh, take a few notes in regard to these two verses today and You'll be blessed when someone says, well, what do you guys do on church on Sundays? And we study the Bible. First John, in fact. Let me tell you what it's about. One and two. Jesus. Amen? Why don't we stand together and pray? We stand, Lord, in honor of you and in honor of your word. We are so privileged to know you, God, to be coming to know you. Lord, every one of us, God, um, are increasing in our understanding of who you are, Lord, and all that you've done. And Lord, your very essence, your person, your character, God, our, our knowledge, our experience is increasing. And we're thankful for that today. It makes us want to be with you, Lord, more and more and more and more to live in your presence, to abide in you, Jesus, to walk in the Spirit, just to never leave. Um, though our feet may move from place to place, Lord, your presence can go with us wherever we do. And thus it just increases, Lord, our, Lord, our relationship, our friendship with you. And as we're enjoying this season already, uh, to that end here in 1 John, increase, Lord, what our relationship with you looks like and how it works. God, deepen it, Lord. Deepen our devotion as we continue to study through your word as John exhorts us. And it's so, so important. We thank you, Lord. Bless your people. Feed your sheep, God. Just wash them, refresh them. Send us out, Lord, uh, satiated only with you. And um, energetically, God, engaging in our ministry. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for these saints that are gathered here today. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. We just give you our allegiance and we give you our obedience. Instruct us. In Jesus' name, let's say it together. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we took note of last week in our introduction to 1 John, if you weren't with us, you can listen on the website, you can download our app, uh, you can even get a CD after the service of that message, but we did an introduction to, an overview of, as it were, 1 John, and as we did that, we took note of his main message, his motivation, his sole desire, if you will, in writing this letter, this epistle, and it's to invite the world into what he had, into what he was enjoying, and that is a real, that is a right relationship with God. This former fisherman was so captured by the person of Jesus Christ um, was so exuberant in his love and devotion to the God who saved him from his sin that he's writing this letter to just reveal um, what a relationship with God looks like and how one might enter into it and increase in it. Amen? 
many in John's day were declaring what a real, what a right relationship with God looks like. Many are still trying to tell us in these days, in our time, uh, what it is, what it's all about. Uh, but I like that John is writing to set the record straight. And you might jot that down somewhere in regard to what a real and right relationship with God is all about. Everyone has something to say, right? And the web and Facebook is filled with cliches, good and bad. John is writing to set the record straight. The real deal is right here in 1 John. And I love that. Amen. Uh, many in his day were confused, and we talked about that last Sunday. We'll see it again today on what it is to have a real and a right relationship with God. Uh, confused then, confused now, and so our studying of 1 John is, is relevant, it's prophetic, it's important, and I love it. Along those lines, if you're taking some notes this morning, if you're getting ready to underline, underline in your Bibles a little bit, maybe highlight, it's okay to do that, you know, it's not like sacrilegious or anything. Any recovering religious people out there? You know, it's sacred text. Well, it is sacred text, but God doesn't mind if you underline or highlight. No, not any of you. Just going to let me linger out there with that one. It's okay. You can highlight, make little boxes and circle stuff and, and write on in there. It's, it's super cool. But as we discover, as we remember what it is to have a real relationship with God, I find it interesting, verse 1, verse 2, right here, the opening paragraph, the beginning statement, it's interesting to me, it's important that we note that the foundation of this writing, the foundation of fellowship with God, Though John could have talked about a lot of different things, in verse 3, he shares some of his desire in writing this letter. And that is, look at your Bibles, to create fellowship between all men. That's an aspect of a friendship with God. That's a part of a relationship with the Lord. Hey, it creates fellowship between all men. Peace on earth, we need that today. Desperately. Amen. And all these troubles across the globe, especially in the Middle East, um, the answer is not a political point of view or party. The answer is the Prince of Peace, the person of Jesus Christ. And every single one, Palestinian or, or Jewish or whatever the case may be, we all need Jesus. Amen? So understand, John's writing, we'll talk about this next week probably, to create fellowship between all men. But that's not where he starts. John's writing verse 4, he makes mention of this, to cultivate joy. I can't wait to talk about that. The joy of the Lord. Joy such as the world does not have, nor can it give. The joy of the Lord. John's writing to stir up joy in the lives of all men, verse 4. Both of those points are great. They're very important, but it's not where we start. Verse 1, 1 John chapter 1. He could have begun, he could have chosen to start this epistle, uh, epistle to initiate this discussion um, um, with many different uh, uh, aspects of a relationship with God. But verse 1, he begins by introducing his audience and us this morning to the one, and write this down, to the only one who gives us the right to have a relationship with God. And that is God the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen? Along those lines, Jesus made it so clear. He said this, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except what? Through me. John 10, verse 9, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture as one of my sheep. Peter said this, Acts 4, verse 11, This is the stone, Jesus this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, read it with me, by which we, I love that, don't you, must be saved. One more, the author of Hebrews starts his epistle in the same way that John does here. Listen. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, read this out loud, has in these last days spoken to us by 
His Son. We live in a day and age, a world in which we're caught up, even as Christians, especially as believers, we're caught up and distracted by so many other things, people, places, practices, phenomenons, whatever the case may be. Let's be refreshed for just a moment as we read the first two verses of this most important epistle where John the Beloved, John the Revelator, begins this letter, and it's with the person of Jesus Christ. I love this. He writes of the only one who opens up the door to a relationship, a friendship with God, the one who had so captured his heart and mind, the one who had transformed a fisherman into a, an apostle. And I love how John writes before we begin. I love how he writes. He speaks about Jesus in a way that no other apostle, no other New Testament author or writer does. You're aware of this, right? You'll see shortly. Check out the New Testament. It's awesome. Amen? John speaks with his own unique voice as he writes of, introduces you and me to the person of Jesus Christ that he loves so much, the foundation of a friendship, a relationship with God. And it's a beautiful thing because every single one of us have the opportunity to speak in a unique and particular way of the person of Christ. I cannot speak of him the way you can, for you have a relationship, a friendship with him that I'll never know because it's private, it's personal. Now we all have a friendship, an ever-increasing relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But there's something to be said for a private, personal relationship. You know he has his own secret name for you? Individually, personally. It's amazing to me. It speaks of intimacy, private sort of conversation that can go on as often as we choose. John speaks of Jesus. He talks about God the Son in a way that no one else does because he knew him in a way that no one else did. And I love that. He speaks eloquently, poetically, illustratively, and he begins this epistle, if you've read the Gospel of John, in much of the same way um, that he does there, and it's with the Word, the Word, Jesus Christ. Let's read together verse 1, 1 John 1. That which was from the beginning, not Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or Peter writing to you know, believers dispersed across the globe. He just says, not even, even mentioning his own name, and I like this too, he says, just touching on, just talking about the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He says, that which was from the beginning. And you sort of read that and you're like, well, did I miss something? Nope, this is where it's at. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning what? The Word. The Word of life. The life was manifested and we've seen and bear witness and declare to you. This is why I'm writing to you. We'll see next week, verse 3 and 4. And declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Someone said this and it was great. He said, every man when he sits down to write a letter or when he rises to preach a sermon, has some object in view. By his writing or his preaching, he wishes to produce some effect in the minds and in the hearts and the lives of those to whom his message is addressed. And here, at the very beginning of this letter, John sets down this sole object, speaking of Jesus, this sole object in writing to his people, just Jesus, concerning the word of life. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, the Son of God. God's spoken, as we read in Hebrews, in all sorts of ways in time past, but listen, in these last days, it's all about who? Jesus, Jesus the Son. And that's, of course, where our title for today comes from. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus, because that's what John does here, and that's what we need. If you're questioning, you're wondering about how one enters into a friendship, a relationship with God, it is only through Jesus Christ, the Word of of life. Let's tear this apart. John says, that which was from the beginning, uh, uh, in a storytelling sort of fashion, uh, eloquently, poetically, it's powerful. Uh, he says, that which was from the beginning. He's speaking of the beginning, but he's not talking about the beginning of the world. He's not speaking of the beginning of creation. 
He's touching on what Genesis 1-1 says. He's reminiscing about what he wrote in John 1, verse 1. The beginning there was before there was anything else. The beginning that's mentioned in Genesis 1-1 and John 1-1 is when all that existed was God. To help us understand, someone said this, the beginning of Genesis 1-1 is simple. You know the verse, right? In the beginning. How's it go? Thank you, thank you. In the be It's Genesis 1-1. You know that verse? You have it memorized, don't you? In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The beginning of John 1-1 is profound, he says. In the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word what? <laughs> was God. This author says John takes us back to this time in eternity past to meet this one that he's going to talk to us so much about, to meet this one which was from the beginning. Someone else said, whoever or whatever John wrote of, he said his subject is eternal and therefore is God because they existed before all else and they are the source and basis of the existence of all things. That which was from the beginning, he says, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, not a tangible force, as it were, not a <laughs> unrelatable Entity somehow sitting above creation, ruling and reigning eternally. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we've what? Heard. Which we've seen with our eyes. Which we've looked upon. And looked upon is not redundant. It means to study intensely. To look at with scrutiny and to say, what's that all about? I'm going to really check into the... Uh, whatever I'm looking at. It means to study thoroughly that which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. We've touched physically. This eternal being that John is describing here, of course we know it's Jesus Christ, but as he says here, uh, this eternal being which was from the beginning uh, uh, came to earth and we knew him, we met him. We saw him, we studied him, we looked upon him, we heard him, we touched him. We've had personal experience with this eternal entity, the word of life, Jesus Christ. I love what John says in John 1.14, again, great chapter, real synonymous with 1 John. He says, and the word, Jesus Christ, and the word became what? Flesh and dwelt among us, amazing thing. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, or the only one who ever came from the Father. Read that last part. Full of grace and truth. What's God all about? Well, consider Jesus full of grace and truth. And we know this because we've heard him, we've seen him, we've studied him, our hands have touched him. This is the one that we declare to you. Someone said, we deliver, and I love this statement, we deliver nothing by hearsay, nothing by tradition, nothing from conjecture. We've had the fullest certainty of all that we write and preach. Does that describe your Christianity? That's how John writes here. What we've heard, seen, looked upon, we know the one that we believe in, the one that we love. And thus we can deliver this good news to you confidently because I've had, we have had experience with him personally. I know not of him, but I know him personally, intimately. What a thing. We deliver nothing by hearsay, God forbid, nothing by tradition, blind, empty, vain tradition, nothing from conjecture. Our faith is a faith of certainty. Amen? John is making a number of statements. 
in verse 1 here that are so important. Speaking of this eternal one, the word of life, Jesus Christ, they audibly heard him, physically saw him, intently studied him, tangibly touched him. It would have enormous, and I like that word, enormous implications for his readers and for us today. Three things, if you'll jot them down or just consider with me for just a moment. Uh, 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 John is describing here the enormity of the one who sits outside of time, who was before there was anything else, the word of life, Jesus Christ, and he's saying that one stooped down and came to dwell among us, becoming accessible to us, to pioneer a relationship, a fellowship, a friendship with us. That's incredible. A good word, enormous. <laughs> That's an enormous idea filled with endless possibilities and, 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 and filled with amazing implications. It's incredible. That's the glory of the gospel. That's the goodness of our God. That is Jesus Christ. Amen? Secondly, his words should hold enormous weight here because John was an eyewitness of these things. No conjecture. No cleverly devised sort of tales or stories or, you know, that increased over time and, and then the snowball effect and one thing led to another and before, you know, you know it, it's this when it was never really this and it was that. Or so the skeptics and cynics say. John says, let me tell you, I was there. None of this is a myth. None of this is a tall tale or a what do we call them? Not nursery rhymes, but fables and, and all these kinds of things. The stories that hopefully we don't tell our kids. Have you heard some of those fables? And Anyway, Aesop's fables, those are just downright strange. Anyway, he was an eyewitness of all these things, of his glory, of his majesty, and thus... He could communicate as he's advertising, promoting the person of Jesus Christ, calling all to come to God to find fellowship, friendship with him through this one, this eternal one, the word of life, Jesus Christ. I was an eyewitness. I can declare confidently because I know him that these things are true, that they're certain. That should, that should just excite us. That is a word that holds enormous weight. At least it should. Thirdly, John is writing here, his words should have enormous importance because he's debunking false teaching. He's debunking and revealing the folly of heresy. As we talked about briefly last Sunday, John's writing to address some of the false doctrine that was prevalent in his day. It's still around in ours today, and it's because Satan will always attack the deity of Jesus Christ, or the humanity, or a combination of both. But he'll never let anyone get away with embracing by faith that God is 100%, or Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. It's the only way salvation sticks. If both are not perfectly true, 100% accurate, we have no faith, we cannot be saved. And yet, he picks away at that foundational truth so that he can uproot, if possible, prevent from believing as many people as possible. But John says, I was there, I saw it, and not just me, but we, we were there. My words should hold weight, their implications are enormous because we knew him, we studied him, we listened to him, we saw him, we touched him. Underline that, make sure you take note of it. One of the heresies of Gnosticism, and it's silly. Th th this stuff just gets so silly. I was talking to someone after the first service about the universe and super cool stuff, dark matter and cosmic glue and all this cool stuff. Maybe we'll reference that later. But we were just discussing briefly how, you know, man in his desperate attempt to explain away an ever apparent God, right, just comes up with silly stuff. I mean... Uh, the, the straws that we'll grasp at 
you know, just to explain away his existence and our accountability to him. I mean, it's, it's like a fable, isn't it? It's like a story. It's like old Aesop and, and so on and so forth. But one of the silly sort of issues that Gnosticism had, one of the heresies that they proposed that Jesus um, was God, certainly, but he was not fully man. Now, he looked like it, they'll say. When he hung on the cross, it looked super real. But, you know, he was spiritual, not physical. Because after all, God is spirit. Doesn't the Bible say that? Doesn't it? Not on your head. It does. So, so God is spirit, they'll say. So he can't be physical, so doesn't the Bible say? And then they go on their rabbit trail and bounce over here and over there. And that's how he could walk on water. I love that joke. And they honestly taught this. That's how he could walk on water. Because he wasn't really real at all. So he just kind of hovered around everywhere he went. They'll say Jesus didn't leave footprints when he ate food. And isn't that interesting that it's recorded in Scripture that he took a piece of fish and he ate? He said, I'm hungry, give me some food. Post, post-resurrection, amazing stuff. Anyway, he like sort of, you know, did one of these. Oh, this is delicious. You know, like you couldn't see the other side. And all these sorts of other just foolish um, fairy tales, that's what that stuff is. Uh, but John says, I heard him, I saw him, I studied him, I touched him. He was real. 100% God and 100% man. It can't be any other way or our faith is just folly and we're fools for following it. Peter said, 2 Peter 1.16, and I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. He says, for we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father. Speaking of the transfiguration here, the voice, Peter says, from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We ourselves, the apostles, not just me, but we, we ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. And he says to his audience, you must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns. And Christ, the morning star, shines in your hearts. John is saying much of the same truth here. And now he gets to the point. He reveals the identity, but further speaks poetically and, and just powerfully. He says, concerning the word of what? Concerning the word of... You have, you have a Bible and it's up there. Concerning the, nope, go back to the text. Concerning, you have a Bible, concerning the word of life. The one that he speaks of here, this eternally existent being who was found in flesh, who came through Mary, who was physically present with John and all the rest of the other disciples and apostles, seen, resurrected by over 500 brethren at once, the word of of life, the Word, the same Word that's used in John chapter 1, verse 1. We read that previously. In the Greek, it's the word logos, and this is important. It's not just technical for the sake of being technical. It's powerful in its implication. John is teaching us something here about evangelism. He's speaking using words inspired by the Spirit that meant something to various cultures in his own generation. The description of Jesus Christ in this way, the word, the word of life, meant a great deal. As this author points out, listen, the idea of the logos, of the word, was huge for John. For the Greek world of his day and for the Jewish world of his day, for the Jew, God was often referred to as the word because they knew God perfectly revealed himself in his word. For the Greek, clashing, contradictory cultures, it would seem. 
But history says this, for the Greek, their philosophers had spoken for centuries about what? The logos, what a coincidence. The basis for organization and intelligence in the universe, the ultimate reason, put that in quotes, the word logos, the ultimate reason, I love that, which controls all things. Concerning the word, concerning the word of life, Jesus Christ. Someone said, it is as if John said to everyone, this logos you've been talking about and writing about for centuries, well, we've heard him, seen him, studied him, and touched him. Let us tell you about him. Isn't that great? Concerning what? The word. Concerning the word of life. He says, verse 2, the life was manifested. And I love that word. We have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, put that in some quotations, underline that, that eternal life which was with the Father and manifested to us. He says, firstly, that that Life was manifested. It was made tangible, practically, physically real. We're eyewitnesses. We saw it. We bear witness to it. Our names are on the dotted line. We declare this truth to you because we were there to behold its wonder, its splendor, its glory. Note here, John says, the life was manifested and we've seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father. He's pointing out two things here. Firstly, he's referencing the person of Jesus Christ, the word of life, describing him in this way. He is eternal life. We know this and we'll read a few verses in just a moment that prove it beyond any question. Jesus had life, and most of us get that. He has the gift of eternal life that he gives to those who ask, amen? But we miss sometimes the reality, the fact that Jesus not only has life, Jesus is eternal life. Read with me. John 5, 26, Jesus said this, For as the Father has life in himself, So he is granted the Son to have life in himself. John 6, 47, Most assuredly, verily, verily, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. It's me. And what a beautiful way, what a great reminder as to what salvation truly is. We are getting the gift of God. We are getting the gift of Jesus Christ. It's not just eternal life. The two cannot be separated. Jesus said this, John eleven twenty five. 25, one more, to Martha about Lazarus. Mary was there too. I am, he says. Not I have. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me, what? Shall never die. Eternal life. Jesus Christ, which was with the Father. Jesus not only has everlasting life, he is eternal life. And thus, he is himself Eternal, he is God. Someone said this, we say that people are eternal and that God's word is eternal, but we say this with the understanding that we mean they are eternal in the future sense. They will never perish being immortal. Yet people are not eternal in the past sense, like John is saying here. To say that something is eternal in the past sense is the same as saying that it is equal to God or God's word. Consider Jesus. Jesus made this abundantly clear, John 8, verse 58, to those religious leaders when they questioned who he really was. 
glorying in Father Abraham and that they were his children. You remember? Read all about it, John 8, 58. You imagine what a moment it would have been, and you can watch the video in heaven with me. It's going to be great. Can't wait to watch all these little, little moments in earth's history. I'm sure the biggest angelic television with, I don't know, anyway. Can you imagine what it was like for Jesus, the, the one that we're talking about here, eternally existent, uh, the, the, the great I am, eternal life, the word, the word of life, for Jesus to look at those religious leaders and there in that moment say, before Abraham was, I am. Remember that? Powerful. Reminds me also of when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus when he was in the garden praying. Uh, where's Jesus? And Jesus, Judas had to go up and kiss him and identify him. Are you the one we're looking for? And he said what? Do you remember? Shout it out. Nice and loud. Don't be timid. Thank you. Translational additive. He doesn't say, I am he. He says, I am. And you remember what happened? They fell on their faces before him. Powerful, 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 powerful stuff. This is who Jesus is. The fact that Jesus is eternally existent is also seen in Micah 5, verse 2. I don't think this is on the screen. Wow, nice work, man. Micah 5, 2. It's a famous Christmas verse, but consider its significance as it prophesies about where the Messiah would be born, but who he is. God speaking, and he says, But you, Bethlehem, uh, Ephrathah, Ephrathah. Tony had trouble with Casa de Benedicion. This one's tougher. He says, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, as far as cities go, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old. Not, he's going to be born one day in a barn in a stable in Bethlehem, that's all true, but whose goings forth are from of old, from what? Everlasting, and in the Hebrew, the word everlasting means beyond the vanishing point. And that's actually a mathematical reference that I don't understand at all. Someone tried to explain it to me, smarter than me, after the first service. It's big math stuff. He tried to explain I didn't understand or have a clue what he's talking about. So maybe you highly educated individuals in, in mathematics and whatnot, it's, it's a powerful mathematical expression uh, 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 in regard to who Jesus is, the fact that he always was and always will be. Colossians says this, verse 15 of chapter 1, New Living Translation, Paul there declares, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation, for through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't. Uh, uh, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world, angels, and, and, and so on and so forth, principalities and powers. Paul says everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he literally holds all creation together. That was the conversation as well, dark matter. We don't know what it is, we just know it's there, and it holds the whole universe together. Can't explain it. Nothing really much more to say about it. But it boggles the minds of those who look into it. And it's just Jesus. It's who he is. It's what he does. It's what he's doing right now. Powerful. John says, speaking so intimately, personally, deeply of the one that he loved, so tremendously, he says, eternal life. That's Jesus. Eternal life. That's who he is. That's what he has. Eternal life. The word of life, which was what? With the Father. This is a relational expression here. Speaking singularly of Jesus Christ, eternal life, he says, eternal life which was with 
the Father. And he's referring, of course, here to the relationship uh, that exists between God the Father and God the Son. There was an eternal relationship of love, uh, uh, of fellowship between the Father and Son that existed before the world was ever created. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? Hope you've got scripture to back that up. Well, I do. Jesus said this, John 17, verse 24. He's praying before he goes to the cross with his disciples. He's talking to the Father. Now, what a crazy thing to have written down the prayers that Jesus prayed to God the Father. Incredible, right? Jesus there says this, for speaking to the Father, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. To help us understand, someone said, this eternal relationship is clearly described in the scriptures. But we could also understand it from simple logic. This Bible student says, if God is love, we talked about that last week, 1 John 4, 8, God is love. If God is love, and God is eternal, Micah 5, 2, we understand that love in isolation is meaningless. Love needs an object. And since there was a time before anything was created, there was a time when the only love in the universe was between the members of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Love how John so simply, so easily interprets a subject that seems so complicated for so many. Eternal life, which was with the Father. This one, Jesus Christ, the Word of life, who is eternal uh, uh, and is eternal life himself is distinct from the Father. And yet, of course, they're one and equal. In that wonderful way. Someone said this, and it's a, a great way to help us understand how important the simple statements made in Scripture in regard to the reality of the Trinity. Something that's tough for us to figure out. How could God be three distinct persons and yet one? Just as the Shema uh, um, declares for Israel, given by God, Deuteronomy covered that previously. The Lord your God is what? One. One. You shall love him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The Lord, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. One And yet, Old Testament or new, passage after passage, that points out the fact that this one God is three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Most will say, well, well where is a treatise or a defense or an explanation of in the Scripture? The Trinity. There isn't one. God doesn't need to defend himself or debate with the likes of me or the likes of you. Amen? There's just a clear mention of this reality over and over consistently because it's absolute truth in the same way. God doesn't have a problem with the fact that he created the world in six days. Doesn't really need to get into greater detail than he does in a few chapters in Genesis because that's not what the book's about. Amen? Embrace it. Accept it. Believe it by faith, even though it's hard or don't. Amen. This is who God is, is revealed in the scriptures. John says it here, and many other verses declare it to be so as well. But listen to what this author says. I, I really like how he breaks this down, the angle that he kind of approaches this, this difficulty, um, at least that some have in understanding or accepting what the Bible clearly speaks of so simply. He said this, the Bible links together the names of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a way that is unimaginable for other persons. We read this, Matthew 28, 19, go therefore, you know the verse, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, Jesus said this, right? In the name, say it with me, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now think this through, this author says, yet we would never say, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and, well, Michael the Archangel. 
Because that's what those will say. Well, it doesn't matter. Sure, Jesus said that in Matthew 28, 19, but, but that's not what he meant, or that's not what he intended. Um, yes, it is. And you can't put it any other way, or it doesn't work out. It's not coincidence or happenstance. It's Scripture. You follow? A couple more. This author says, We read, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Great Trinitarian reference. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 13, 14, Be with you all. Son, Father, Holy Spirit. This author says, Yet we would never say, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Apostle Paul and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. He said, we read, 1 Peter 1, 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Great Trinitarian reference. It's just straight scripture. And he says, yet we would never say, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of the Apostle Peter. No giggles. Anyway, it, it's kind of hilarious if you think about it because of the nonsense that we peddle, refusing to accept and understand what the Scripture says, saying it doesn't matter, it's coincidental, it's just far from the truth. The Scripture is that vivid, it is that powerful, and it is meant to be left alone. John says it so simply here, eternal life always existing with the Father made manifest to us. This is our testimony. It's our declaration to you. It is God the Son. It is Jesus Christ, the Word of life. These are words. Glance back down at verse 1 and 2 with me. That which is from the beginning, and we'll close, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, studied intently, our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we've seen and bear witness and declare to you, this is the good part, we'll see next week. And declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, he'll go on to say, is extended and offered to you. But as we close for today, these are words that come from a man, without question, who knew and knows his God, knew and knows Jesus Christ. I don't think anyone would disagree that, that John has a real and right relationship with God simply because of how he speaks, consistent with Scripture, of the one that he loved so much. And I pray, and we've inserted this thought at a few points throughout this message this morning, I pray that in some way or another, you and I can speak the same way of the Lord that we say we love so much. As we seek to advertise to the world the good news, the grace of God, the word of life, as we seek to speak about the one that is the foundation of truth, the only door by which a man can walk through and find fellowship with God. As our lives are fully and solely and totally about Jesus Christ, preaching and teaching Jesus Christ, does it sound something like this? And I understand that, you know, unfortunately we weren't around, you or I, during the earthly ministry of Jesus, and we haven't touched him physically, and so on and so forth, but, but this is the point. John's words hold such weight because he had experience to share with his listeners, his audience. There has got to be, for you and I, some experience in our sharing. There's got to be a, a, a certain reality behind the words that we are pouring out to those who need to hear them if they're going to take seriously what we're saying. You know, oftentimes, and some will say evangelism is dead, believe it or not, today. Have you heard that? Some are declaring this. Look at the statistics and how few Christians share the gospel or share their faith with anyone. They are startling. They are a little scary. But maybe it's because, I don't believe it's true, but maybe it's because we lack something to say. 
And there are those that, you know, pull out little cue cards or little scripts, and they're like, excuse me, let me find my place for just a minute. The wages of sin, sin is, thank you, thank you, is death. Oh, okay. Would you like to receive Jesus now? Anyway, you get the picture. How is someone supposed to buy into that? How is someone supposed to believe you when you say scriptural, biblical things? As you share words that maybe aren't your own. John writes uniquely. John writes personally. He talks about Jesus in a way that no one else does. And you have the same opportunity. Do you know that? People give pastors way too much credit. Do you know that? Do you know that? It's true. You can say yes and laugh and, and so on and so forth. It's okay. Way too much credit. Um, we forget that we together are the body of Christ and no one part or piece is more significant or special or talented than another. Do you know, you can speak of Jesus Christ in a way that John the Apostle could never speak of him and certainly in a way that I never could either because our relationship with him is unique, it's personal, it's privileged, it's private. Just as John leaned back on the, the chest of Jesus and there was intimacy, there was exchange there, there was fellowship and friendship, we're invited to enjoy through his writing. It's why he's speaking the same thing. That we might reveal him to the world in similar but unique ways. You have the opportunity to preach the gospel, to be a light for Christ, to talk about who he is and what he's done in a way that no one else does. There's privilege there, and the privilege of such powerful sharing, where they see it in your eyes, and maybe they think you're crazy, but at least they know you believe what you're saying. Amen? There is such privilege in sharing in that way that comes through accessing the person that John is introducing us to here. There's got to be a certain reality in our sharing, something of experience associated there if we want others to give us a moment of their consideration as we preach the gospel. I pray we're stirred by even two verses. I pray by we're, that we're stirred by how John speaks of Jesus Christ here. Uh, uniquely, poetically, eloquently, just beautifully. It's like you want to dig deeper. You want to go a little further uh, discussing and, and developing this train of thought. And we'll certainly do that. I want to be able to speak of Jesus in a, in a unique but similar way that John the Apostle does here. And I pray you desire the same thing. If you do, it's really simple. Most biblical, foundational, very important truths are, we know this, right? That's what's great about, that's what's great about our God. He's gracious. The most important truths are really, really simple. If you want to know Jesus the way John did, speak of Jesus, share of Jesus, in unique, powerful, expressive, poetic, successful ways, Simply spend time in his presence, just as John did. Spend time in his presence. What did John say to us here? That, that he's the logos, he's the word of life. Yes, he's the one who said, let there be, and there was. But nonetheless, he's the word, he's the logos, he's the Bible that we're opening today. And that we have the privilege of tearing apart every Every day of our lives, we're surrounded with technology. We can pump the Word of God into our ears 24-7 if we so desire. We can take it with us anywhere we go. You know what the Bible was written on in John's day? Like big giant scrolls and like even, even 1 John as small as it is. Like an 18-inch piece of papyrus and you know, you're going to strap on the scroll and take it to work and pull it out at lunch and, and we can put it in our ears. so simple for us to associate ourselves with the word of life to get to know this great God through the person of Jesus Christ Jesus said this and we'll close Matthew 7 7 New Living Translation he said keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for keep on seeking and you will find keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for 
everyone who asks, what? Receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. To everyone who knocks, the door will be open. That's his invitation to you. That's his invitation to me. Come, come, come hang out. Come fellowship. Come abide in me and I'll abide in you. Come be at home with me and I'll be at home with you. Father, our hearts, I pray, are stirred toward this glorious end. Just like John as he's writing to extend an invitation into a relationship with God, it comes only through the person of Jesus Christ. Nothing, no one else, just this everlasting God that we're reading about, privileged to know. Stir us today, God, we're asking you, we're praying right now. Stir us, stir me to know you all the more. To increase, Lord, in my understanding of who you are, my experience, Lord, with you. I want to be able to speak of you, Jesus, to a certain extent in the way that John does here. That the world may know that you're the source of life salvation, Lord, for our souls, uh, the Savior of our sin, from sin. Stir in us, Lord, a hunger, a thirst. You said, as we prayed already, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. Lord, you said, ask and seek and knock. If you want me, I'm right here. Lord, help us, raise us up to be seekers of the living God. Those who choose to just sit still and be quiet and crack open the Bible and spend time with you. Those who get to know you by spending time with you. It's so simple, Lord. And it's going to mean so much when it comes to speaking about you. Lord, we need to have some weight behind our words. We need to have some kind of experience in our sharing. And so cultivate that, we pray. Encourage us. Lord, to make our Christianity, to make our faith more than just Lord, something that others speak of and we nod our heads, but something of association, something of personal experience, God, as we encounter you every day. Lord, the world needs to know. And so, God, use us as that ambassador. Use us, Lord, to be those who introduce Jesus and just Jesus to the world who so desperately needs him. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We give you our heart. We give you our lives. Lord, we commit ourselves to your service. Send us out, Lord, in strength and in power, Lord. We will not go out in our own strength, with our own might, Lord, with our own quote-unquote wisdom, Lord, we are asking to be empowered by your Spirit, Lord. Give us boldness, Lord, to go and to do what you've called us to do, each one in our own unique way. We thank you. God, we love you. We're so grateful for your grace freely poured out on us. Bless your kids. In Jesus' name, let's say together. And we say, Amen. Amen. The Lord is good. If you'd like any...